Hello everyone, thank you for joining today. My name is Jessica Falcone. I'm with TDT on the technical sales side. I wanted to thank you for uh, taking the time to listen to uh, TD Talks webinar. Uh, we're focusing on fiber photometry for this series and this will be our second talk in the series. Um, today we have Ted Shu, who is a postdoc in Mitch Reutemann's lab over at the University of Illinois at Chicago. So we're looking forward to hearing hearing um, his talk today. And uh, just for a little background on Ted, his general or his broad interest in neuroscience include understanding neural pathways and mechanisms underlying motivated behaviors that govern our day-to-day -day lives. Um, he has he received his PhD from the University of Southern California in Dr. Scott Kanowski's lab. And for his PhD work, he was studying the neurobiological systems that regulate feeding behavior, focusing on behaviors that mediate excessive food intake. And now for his postdoctoral work, he's continuing to study neurobi neurobiological control of motivated behaviors and with a focus on real-time activity of the mesolimbic dopamine system. And so we're looking forward to hearing, uh, he's gonna present his research today, so we're looking forward to hearing the talk. Uh, really, just some quick housekeeping. We do have a questions tab. We'll leave time at the end for some Q&A. So feel free to type your questions in while the uh, talk is ongoing, and um, we'll just field those questions at the end. There's also a chat bar, so feel free to enter your questions in there. And without further ado, I will hand the floor over to Ted. All right. Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, thank you everybody for coming and this opportunity to speak today. Um, so I'm really excited to present some of our data where we've used fiber photometry to look at um, the neurobiological pathways that regulate motivated and goal-directed behaviors um, and how they're kind of modulated by need states like thirst and hunger. So. The way I like to start this talk okay, um, is to sort of emphasize this fundamental concept where all organisms have developed a set of adaptive behaviors to seek out and consume food and water in order to maintain homeostatic balance and survive. And it's through examining these kind of fundamental behaviors and fundamental neural circuits that can sort of allow us to further understand when these adaptive goal-directed behaviors can become maladaptive. Um, so just to take a little bit of a step back, um, I was talking about how um, it's important for us to understand these basic neural circuits so we can understand maladaptive goal-directed behaviors that are prevalent in the obesity epidemic where individuals often consume, uh, excessively consume food beyond metabolic need. And so with that in mind, um, it seems clear that the that homeostatic perturbations like thirst and hunger and the physiological mechanisms that are geared toward detecting these perturbations have substantial overlap and integration with the neural substrates that mediate motivation, reward, and cognition. Now, in recent years, the neural substrates that detect homeostatic imbalance, as well as those that um, mediate goal direction have been um, well studied and are relatively well understood. However, the interaction between these two substrates is largely unknown. And so in an effort to answer these questions, our lab has focused on body fluid homeostasis, specifically thirst, as a tool for us to kind of understand this integration between changes in need states and the invigoration of the appropriate goal-directed behaviors. And another uh, emphasis and focus in our lab is the mesolimbic dopamine system as a substrate that's critical for regulating goal-directed behaviors. More specifically, the phasic activity of dopamine neurons in the ventral tegmental area and dopamine release to the nucleus accumbens is not only poised to respond to primary nutritive reinforcement, 
but these signals also develop to cues that are predictive of those reinforcements to then invigorate uh, the appropriate goal-directed behaviors. Now, with this concept of overlap and integration in mind, um, in order to sort of express the right goal-directed behavior, um, the mesolimbic dopamine system has to receive need state information from brain regions that are capable of detecting changes in physiological state. And in the context of thirst, circumventricular organs, in particular the subfornical organ, are is well poised to detect changes in body fluid homeostasis through thirst factors like angiotensin II and blood hyperosmolarity. And more recent data has demonstrated that glutamatergic neurons within the SFO are critical for driving uh, thirst-motivated behaviors. And so the overarching question that we wanted to address with the data I'll be showing today is how do thirst pathways engage phasic dopamine signaling and invigorate the subsequent appropriate goal-directed behavior? And the way we've done this, of course, is to measure dopamine neuroactivity in awake and behaving rats with fiber photometry. And as many of you know, fiber photometry uses genetically encoded fluorescent sensors to measure either neuronal activity with uh, calcium activity as a proxy or neurotransmitter release, which in our case is dopamine release to uh, dopaminergic terminal regions like the nucleus accumbens. So how did we use fiber photometry to selectively measure the mesolimbic dopamine system. So first, to measure the activity of dopamine neurons, we've used Th creative positive transgenic rats, who essentially have creative recombinase expressed in dopamine neurons of the VTA, which then allows us to uh, deliver a Cree-dependent GCAMP that's been packaged in AAV directly to the VTA, thus allowing us to selectively transfect dopamine neurons with GCAMP. And the image below here is just demonstrating that we can selectively transfect dopamine neurons with GCAMP. And so very quickly, as many of you are quite familiar with, as calcium binds onto GCAMP, this will increase GFP fluorescence, and we can measure this with a fiber optic implant placed above the VTA. Okay, so we now we have a tool to measure dope, the activity of dopamine neurons, but what about dopamine release? Um, and with the advent of developing technologies to measure neurotransmitter release, we've uh, used D-Lite 1.2 that, that is packaged in AAV and delivered to the nucleus accumbens. And similar to GCAMP, as dopamine binds onto D-Lite, this will increase GFP fluorescence. And again, we can measure this with a fiber optic implant placed in the nucleus accumbens. And so with that, we have the tools in place to measure uh, the activity of the mesolimbic dopamine system in awake and behaving rats. Um, but of course, the question that we want to address is how does changes in thirst might modulate the activity of the mesolimbic dopamine system? And so what we've done is use a very basic Pavlovian conditioning task where rat, thirsty rats are trained to associate an audio cue with brief access to a water sipper. Um, and in the video I'll be showing you below are these thirsty rats, they're well trained. And on the left video, you'll see dopamine neuron calcium activity in the VTA. And on the right, you'll see nucleus accumbens dopamine release, both represented as white traces. And as you can see in each video, there's a red line indicating when the cue is presented. And what you'll be able to appreciate is that, in, particularly in these thirsty rats, is once the cue is presented, is this robust increase in phasic dopamine signaling, both at the level of dopamine neurons in the VTA, as well as nucleus accumbens dopamine release. And another thing you might be able to appreciate is that this robust increase often occurs uh, before the animal makes that first lick after the sipper is presented. Now, when we train these rats, since they are highly motivated to access water, they learn it very quickly. Um, in this example, this cohort of rats learned the task in about three days, 
Um, we can measure using lickometers individual licks across each session. Um, and we can measure behavioral um, performance by looking at their latency to the first lick. On the right here, you can see as they become more proficient in this task, they get, they get faster and faster at approaching the sipper. Um, and we can also measure lick rate, in this case, lick rate in the first burst where um, they increase lick, licking rate as they become more proficient in this task. Um, but of course, the advantage of photometry is not only are we able to measure the animal's behavior, but also the signals within the VTA or the nucleus accumbens. Um, and what I wanted to show you all next is kind of how we process how we process our photometry signal. This is the raw signal, as you can see here, with the uh, calcium or D light independent excitation, the 405 nanometer wavelength and the calcium or D-light dependent uh, signal um, shown here in green. And what we do is subtract these two signals using a Fourier transform subtraction, and then we normalize our data by converting our signal into z-scores. So the trace below here is our process signal that we use to analyze our data. Now, while we can measure every single transient that occurs across the session. Of course, as I've emphasized, we can also look at our signal in relation to behavioral events that are occurring in the chamber, which in our case is, um, it could be the, in this case, I'm showing when the cues are presented. And then we can time lock and average our signal um, relative to cue onset. And I've mentioned how uh, easily these animals learn this task and, and What's important here is really um, as the animal becomes more proficient at learning this paradigm, this is also reflected at the level of dopamine neuron activity in the VTA. So this is a color plot with the hot color showing um, higher signal. And as you can see, as animals become proficient in the task, as they undergo more and more trials, you can see increasingly time lock signal to the cue. So again, as animals become more proficient in this task, it's also this is also represented as Q evoked dopamine signals, in this case, within dopamine neurons in the VTA. Um, we can take these data and then average it. And so again, this is just showing these, these data averaged in a single trace. And as you can see here, as the animal progresses across days, you get this increasingly robust Q evoked signal on day three. Now, back to my our original question, does thirst modulate this, this sort of robust Q-evoked dopamine neuron activity? And of course, we've trained our animals thirsty. Um, so the question then becomes whether this effect is dependent on the need state of the animal. Does the animal need to be thirsty or not to see this um, robust water Q-evoked dopamine signal? And the way we've addressed this question is, is beginning at the basics. So what we've done here is take our thirsty rats, um, place them back on adlet and access to water such that they're water sated or euvolemic. And then what we do is either uh, overnight water deprive the rats or uh, keep them euvolemic in a counterbalance within subject design. So, what do we see? So what we, what we see first is in this red trace is uh, water deprived animals. And as you expect, um, we see a very robust water cue evoked VTA dopamine neuron calcium signal. But when the same animals are euvolemic, when they're not thirsty, we see a significant decrease in water cue evoked dopamine neuron activity, an effect that's recapitulated at the level of nucleus cumbens dopamine release. So we begin to see some hints suggesting that the mesolimbic dopamine system is capable of responding to particular need states of the animal. In this case, it's only when the thirsty, when the animals are thirsty, do we see this robust Q evoked signal. And in, and in some ways, it's kind of an, an obvious uh, outcome where, of course, when animals are thirsty, they're going to they're going to want to seek out water. Um, but another thing I wanted to emphasize is that I've emphasized earlier that this, this 
these changes in dopamine signals are reflected by the rat's behavior. So as you can see here in the black bar, when animals are not thirsty, they are slower to approach the sipper compared to water deprived animals. And they also have a decrease in lick rate. So um, this sort of decrease in goal-directed behaviors because the animals are not thirsty are not, is not only reflected by the animal's uh, dopamine signals, but also by the animal's behavior. So how do we associate the animal's behavior to what we see neurophysiologically? And so what we've done is, as you can see here, this is a trace from a single trial. And what we've done is superimpose the single trial trace with the uh, behavior that animals engaging in in the chamber. So each black tick is a lick, and we can calculate things like lick rate um, represented in these gray boxes. Now what we can do is take the behavior and the signal from these single trials and take every single trial and utilize regression models to generate um, predictive relationships. So what we found was that as animals exhibit faster first lick latencies, they also exhibit larger Q evoke signals. In other words, the larger uh, Q evoke dopamine activity we see, the faster the animal is at approaching the sipper. And we see a similar relationship with lick rate. As Q evoke dopamine signals go up, as do lick rates. And we also see interactions between whether rats are euvolemic or water deprived. And so there's two points that I kind of want to take away here. First is kind of uh, the beginnings of our answer to the research question, that being, um, in this case, what we're demonstrating is that uh, there is need state selective recruitment of phasic dopamine activity to sort of guide animals towards uh, engaging in the appropriate type of goal-directed behaviors. In this case, when animals are thirsty, they should seek out water. And this is reflected both at the behavioral level as well as um, the neurophysiological level. Um, the second thing I wanted to emphasize is um, that with fiber photometry, we get these very rich data sets that kind of allow us to perform these types of, of modeling and can certainly go beyond um, what I'm showing here. So I've talked about need state selective recruitment of these dopamine signals, but of course the question still is whether these, this effect can become generalized to other need states. Um, one obvious one, of course, is whether the animal's hungry or not. So do, do these, these water cue evoke signals, can they be generalized to food when the animals are hungry? In this case, we're showing that is not the, the case in this kind of uh, blue-green trace, you see that when animals are hungry, we see no effect on the water cue evoke dopamine signals compared to when animals are thirsty in this red trace. So again, emphasizing this uh, capability of dopamine neurons to, to selectively respond to cues that are relevant to the, the current need state. Um, so I, I also wanted to take a little a bit of a detour um, and sort of talk about how we process our data, um, particularly how it, it's related to normalization procedures. So this, these are the data I showed you earlier, except that it is not normalized. You can see quite a lot of variability in the water depth condition requiring us to normalize our, our signal. Um, now the question becomes, okay, how do we normalize our signal? It turns out in our laboratory, we've done this quite a few different ways. Um, and here I'm showing three of them. One way that we can do it is normalize to the mean transient amplitude of the entire session. So what? So take the amplitude of every single transient across the session and then normalize it to the mean of that amplitude. We can also normalize it to a kind of quote unquote baseline, which in this case is five seconds before the Q onset and convert our data to Z scores. And then the way we've sort of settled on is to normalize to or convert our data to Z score based on the entire session. Um, but really my, my point here is that 
with these many different types of normalization techniques, we essentially get um, the, a very similar outcome. And in our case, when animals are thirsty, there's there's this robust increase in uh, Q-evoked dopamine signals. Um, but again, my, my point here is, you know, with, with a rich data set comes a certain amount of responsibility in that um, we should analyze our data in many different ways to see if we can achieve the same outcome. Um, and again, just just sort of emphasizing this this need to be careful with with the rich data sets that we're all getting when performing photometry. Now, with a rich data set that comes from from, from uh, photometry, we can also combine other techniques with it. So, for us, in an effort to to delve a little bit deeper into the mechanisms in which how these kind of thirst driven q evoked dopamine signals arise, we've, uh, we've sort of progressed towards combining pharmacology with fiber photometry to answer whether hormonal signals that relay need states can modulate these water q evoked dopamine signals. And so in addition to the fiber optic implant, we've also implanted intracranial cannula tar targeting the lateral ventricles. So what we've done here is first in the green trace is central administration of a hunger hormone called ghrelin. When injected into the brain, ghrelin um, stimulates feeding behavior. And like we saw with food deprivation, when we inject this hunger hormone, we see almost no effect on water cue of our dopamine signals. But importantly, this, these same animals, um, when they're water deprived, we can sort of Reemerge this this Q evoked this sort of robust increase in Q evoked dopamine activity. Um, again, just a reminder: these animals are euvolemic, so they're not thirsty. On the other hand, we can also deliver a thirst hormone called angiotensin II into the brain. And in contrast to the ghrelin data, when we inject this thirst hormone we can significantly increase water q evoked dopamine activity um, compared to vehicle-treated animals to the extent that it almost mimics the effects that we see when the same animals are water-deprived. Um, and importantly, this thirst factor, angiotensin II, acts on the subfornical organ to engage thirst-motivated behaviors. So now we've sort of begun to see a mechanism begin to form where a peripheral thirst signal in angiotensin II is signaling to the brain to then engage the mesolimbic dopamine system. But the question, of course, still remains as to whether or not the subfornical organ is important for relaying that information. So when animals are thirsty, angiotensin signals to SFO glutamatergic neurons. Does this, this, this sort of need state detector relay thirst information to VTA dopamine neurons? And so progressing in our effort in combining fiber photometry with other techniques, we've chosen a chemogenic approach to manipulate SFO glutamatergic neurons using designer receptors exclusively activated by designer drugs or dreads to either activate or inhibit SFO glutamatergic neurons. Um, here we have the HM3DQ dread packaged with CAMK2A or the HM4DI dread, again packaged with CAMK2A um, promoter to selectively transfect these SFO glutamatergic neurons. And consistent with previous data, when you activate SFL glutamatergic neurons in water sated animals or euvolemic animals, you can increase water intake relative to a vehicle treatment or decrease water intake in water restricted rats when we inhibit um, SFL glutamatergic neurons using the dreads ligand clozapine and oxide. So, with this sort of validation of these chemogenetic approaches, we've combined dreads mediated activation or inhibition of SFO glutamatergic neurons with in vivo fiber photometry in dopamine neurons of the VTA to determine whether um, manipulating these 
acephaloglutaminergic neurons can in turn modulate phasic dopamine responses to cues that predict water availability. So these are the data. This is euvolemic water-sated rats um, treated with vehicle in this black trace here. You can see consistent with what we saw earlier, when animals are not thirsty, you don't see much of a response in dopamine neurons. However, and quite remarkably, when we activate SFO glutaminergic neurons with CNO, we get a significant increase in this water Q evoke VTA dopamine neuron calcium activity. And in contrast, when we take water-restricted rats, so these are thirsty rats, and inhibit SFL glutamatergic neurons, we can significantly uh, attenuate this water Q evoked VTA dopamine neuron calcium activity. And so together, these data begin to tell us that indeed, SFL glutamatergic neurons are detecting the, are, are important for detecting the thirsty state, but also relaying this information downstream to engage dopamine neurons in the VTA to then uh, invigorate the correct type of goal-directed behavior. Um, and we can demonst we've demonstrated this simply by taking uh, water or water sated or water restricted rats and either activating or inhibiting SFO glutamatergic neurons. One little caveat I'll mention here is that when we inhibit SFL glutamatergic knot, it doesn't completely erase this Q evoke response. And we, we sort of hypothesize that this is because of redundant thirst pathways that, are, that exist in the brain. Um, I talked about circumventricular organs, and um, this is comprised of a network of brain regions that include the SFO. So it's quite possible that because these animals are thirsty, we're engaging uh, other pathways that might um, preserve this response. Now, we now have evidence suggesting that, okay, the SFO is relaying information to VTA dopamine neurons, but how is it this information getting there, right? So we've begun to address this question by taking a neuroanatomical approach, and through combing the literature, we found not very much evidence that the SFO has any monosynaptic or direct projections to the VTA. And we've uh, demonstrated this in our lab by taking advantage of the interrograde properties of um, dreads, as well as the selective expression of these dreads into glutamatergic SFO neurons. And when we look in the VTA, we see no evidence of axon terminal fields. We've also, um, and in support of this, also injected a retrograde tracer called fluorogold into the VTA. And when we look in the SFO, we see no evidence of back-labeled cell bodies. Again, emphasizing that the SFO doesn't have a direction, direct projection to the VTA, but perhaps suggests that the SFO is communicating to the dopamine system through a multi-ordered or polysynaptic pathway through some intermediary brain region. What is that intermediary, intermediary brain region? Well, we've identified the lateral hypothalamic area as a potential relay region within this SFO to VTA pathway. Given that the LHA is important in regulating drinking behaviors, but also that the SFO sends a direct projection to the LHA, and the LHA in turn sends direct projections to the VTA. So we thought this might be a promising first uh, candidate to look at. Now, how exactly did we trace this kind of transsynaptic polysynaptic multi-ordered pathway. And what we've done is taken a viral approach. Turns out you can utilize an AAV1 package with Cree recombinase. And with this AAV, it, has, it does something very special in that it'll essentially jump a synapse. So in other words, for us, when we inject AAV1 Cree into the SFO, the viral particles jump a synapse into the LHA and transfect LHA cell bodies with AAV1 Cree. When we see cell bodies in the LHA, that tells us that these cell bodies receive direct input from the SFO. And we can visualize that by injecting another virus um, that is Cree dependent um, and also interrograde tracer. In this case, we use uh, AAV1 Flex TD tomato, inject it to the LHA to visualize these cell bodies. But what we, what we also get out of this is that we can also look at axon terminal fields in the VTA. So any axons that we see in the VTA 
come from cell bodies in the LHA that also receive input from the SFO. In other words, this, is, this gives us a very handy way to give us a first look at this putative uh, transsynaptic pathway. And so these are preliminary data from that experiment. This is an injection site in the SFO. In the LHA, we see robust expression of cell bodies. Again, these cell bodies receive input from the SFO. And indeed, when we look in the VTA, we see evidence of axon terminal fields. Again, these axons come from cell bodies in the LHA that also receive input from the SFO. So with that, we have sort of anatomical evidence suggesting that indeed the SFO might communicate to the VTA through the lateral hypothalamus. But of course, this is but one pathway um, that might mediate the effects that I showed you guys earlier. Um, there are a number of other pathways that might um, be utilized to communicate their information to the VTA, one of which includes the MNPO, um, which receives input from the SFO and also projects to the lateral hypothalamus. So we're, we're taking advantage of this AB1 CRE tracing strategy to sort of characterize the pathways through which the VTA receives thirst information. But besides um, these sort of anatomical advantages, we can also use AAB. Oh, one more thing. Um, this is just giving us a sort of functional glimpse of, of what we could do with this AAB1 CRE. We did very basic CFOS staining to look at uh, recently active neurons. And what we found with these kind of preliminary data is that only within the water deprived condition do we see co localization of CFOS and flex TD tomato. That's not as evident when the animals are food deprived or when they're ad libitum fed and watered, suggesting that it's only when the animals are thirsty are these LHA neurons that receive SFO input are they activated. Um, so again, this gives us a window into how need states are kind of parsed out within the lateral hypothalamus and putatively communicate to the VTA where perhaps parallel pathways that regulate thirst and regulate hunger synapse onto different uh, populations of VTA dopamine neurons. Um, and this is an avenue that we're kind of actively pursuing. Um, so besides these pr preliminary glimpses with AAV1 CRE, Another thing we can do to sort of functionally um, utilize this transsynaptic tracing strategy is to inject AAV1 CRE to the SFO. And instead of a CRE dependent interrograde tracer, we can deliver a CRE dependent DRED, right? Either the excitatory or inhibitory form to the LHA. That will then allow us to either activate or inhibit SFO to LHA pathways while simultaneously measuring dopamine release um, within the nucleus accumbens to determine whether this pathway is important for regulating thirst-motivated behaviors and subsequent uh, responses in the accumbens. But we might predict in a uh, uvolemic rat, where if you activate this pathway, you might see an increase in water cube of dopamine activity, or if you inhibit this pathway in thirsty rats, you might see an attenuation of this um, response. Um, and this is sort of a future direction that we're, we're also pursuing. But uh, um, one thing that I also wanted to emphasize is it sort of demonstrates the versatility of fiber photometry, where not only can we perform within subject uh, experiments, but also combine them with sophisticated viral strategies to, to manipulate the pathways that we're interested in. So with that, I'd just like to wrap up and sort of give you guys a takeaway where I hope I've shown you all that need states like thirst, which are communicated to the brain through hormonal signals and peripheral signals like angiotensin II and blood osmolarity act in the SFO to then communicate to the lateral hypothalamus to then parse out the appropriate information to engage VTA dopamine neurons, release dopamine to the accumbens, and then invigorate the correct type of goal-directed behaviors. In this case, the rat is required to seek out water. Um, but besides that, I hope what I've shown you all with the data today is that there's this critical integration and overlap 
between the neurophysiological mechanisms that regulate homeostatic balance and mesolimbic dopamine pathways command goal-directed behaviors. And I hope these are concepts that we can apply across different need states, um, not only uh, body fluid homeostasis, but also hunger and satiety, um, sort of in an effort to understand the fundamental circuits um, that regulate these types of goal direct behaviors and you know how might they go a wire in the case of the obesity epidemic or drug addiction how might these pathways become hijacked or to influence an individual to consume more than he or she needs um, so with that I'll leave it at that um, I just wanted to acknowledge my laboratory uh, my mentor Dr. Mitch Reutman those who have helped me with this project my left co-owner here is bolded because he's a graduate student who sort of spearheaded our photometry efforts in the lab and has been kind of integral in establishing it in our laboratory. Uh, Dr. Jamie Reutman and James McCutcheon, both of which are have been incredibly helpful for us in not only processing photometry data, but also a number of troubleshooting problems. Um, I'd also like to thank our funding sources and thank you all for listening. And I'd be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you so much. That was excellent. Thank you for presenting your work. Uh, we've got a whole host of questions that have come in, so let me just Great. jump right on into it. Um, okay. TS has asked a methodology-based question. He's wondering if sure. you could, or they were wondering if you could describe in greater detail uh, the mm -hmm. Fourier transform subtraction as a method ah. for, um, yeah, correcting for motion artifact and bleaching. Right, so it's a custom MATLAB script that we use. Um, as a matter of fact, I think in MATLAB there's a there's an FFT function that you can use. But essentially, what it does is, you know, you convert all your data from the time domain to the frequency domain, and then what happens is uh, frequencies that are identical in the um, 405 excitation and the 465 excitation are subtracted from each other, and what happens is essentially it, it, it flattens and subtracts motion artifacts. Um, I will say that it's not entirely perfect. Um, if an animal you know, pulls out its, its uh, patch cord or you get really intense movement artifacts and it doesn't do a perfect job, but for us at least, it's been really nice in terms of, of uh, flattening our data. Okay. And I'm, I'm happy if you, if you want to email me, I can, I can send you the code that we use to do that. Oh yeah, and uh, speaking of that too, just really quick, um, I'll look in, out in, uh, look out in your emails. We are going to host a, a separate Zoom session sometime next week, where Ted and uh, Mitch will just get on, and we can just talk and have some conversations. So also keep that in mind as well. That'll be another opportunity to ask questions. Um, the next uh, question we have is from. John Woodward, and they're wondering, does the audio signal alone induce any change in the G6 or D light signal? And they have a second one after that. Um, you mean the audio cue that the animal learns? I believe, to... yeah, I believe so. Right, so what, we can, what we've done actually is, um, so the audio cue I, I, I showed you guys was one that was associated with the water sipper. Um, but we've also done an experiment where animal has to discriminate between an uh, audio cue that, that presents the water sipper and an audio cue that presents nothing, right? Um, in that case, you see almost no response to this, I guess, CS minus, basically, um, essentially controlling for whether, you know, s the, the sound might influence the, the animal's uh, response. Okay. And John was also wondering what light power uh, did you guys use ah, during your fiber photometry um, recordings? We do 30 watts, microwatts from each mm -hmm. uh, wavelength. Okay. Um, next, uh, Perla was wondering um, what was, uh, what viral vector did you use to target the dopaminergic neurons in it, the Long Evans rats? Right, so the, the D-light, right? Is that right? Uh, it did not. Uh, yeah, dopamine. So yeah, D light. Okay, so for for D light, that's it has a H syn promoter, so it'll transfect any neuron, pretty much. Um, 
for the GCAMP, it's a flex GCAMP, so it will only transfect neurons that also have career combinants. Okay, very good. Um, next from Michael, they were wondering, when mice are tested in the hung, uh, when hungry, do you have some sense of how much water they have ingested in that fasted state? Um, they were suggesting, um, is it likely they are drinking far less due to, um, oh, because they're not eating dry rodent chow? Right, so that is actually a really important point because then, as a matter of fact, in, in nature, right, so eating and drinking are very intimately intertwined. So it's, it's, it's certainly likely that the, the, the animals are drinking less water because they also haven't eaten, right? Um, in our experiments, at least, for example, in the uvolemic state, the rats aren't really drinking that much water to begin with. Um, so there's, I guess the point of your question is whether um, the signals that we're seeing are kind of confounded by, by whether the animal's eating or not, right? Um, I will say that that's an experiment that I'm really interested in doing, um, sort of this, the the uh, effects of postprandial thirst on dopamine activity. Um, but I will also mention that um, in our laboratory, another thing we do is intraoral delivery of reinforcements, um, whether it be hypertonic saline or water or sucrose, um, in which case you can sort of, uh, I guess, bypass the, the compound where the animal doesn't really consume food or, or water. Um, but again, these are experiments that I'm really interested in doing. Again, the, the relationship between eating and, and drinking water. Okay. Um, another question is uh, why from Yi Fang was why is the SO, SFO uh, showing red? And is it because the TDT tomato uh, is also retrograde? Right, that's a great question. So the AV1 Cree doesn't have a floor for attached to it. So what you there's two ways to kind of go around that um, to verify your injection site. One is you can co-inject with uh, you know floor gold or CTB to visualize the injection site. What we've been doing is uh, immunohistochemistry for Cree, basically. So we did uh, IHC for Cree, and the secondary antibody was in red. So what you're seeing in the SFO when it lights up red is not the TD tomato, but the amino that we ran. Okay. And then uh, Zhao Fan was wondering, have you recorded from the SFO or LHA neurons uh, to see whether they respond to cues? Right, so that is an excellent question. And as a matter of fact, I would do those experiments if they weren't published already. Um, but what happens in SFO neurons is actually really interesting. Um, so first, in the SFO, when the animal begins to drink water, right, that first lick, what happens in the SFO is the signal just does like a DC shift. It just, it drops. Um, quite a contrast with dopamine neurons, right? Because in dopamine neurons, we see an increase to the Q. Turns out the SFO, its responses are tied to the ingestion of water. So when cues associated with water are presented to the animal, you don't see much of an effect in the SFO. It's only when the animal makes that first lick, you see a drop in signal. So another question that we're trying to sort of figure out is how is this drop in signal in the SFO translated to an increase in activity in dopamine neurons? So there's a, there's a few layers to your question in that how can we, you know, record from the SFO or record from the LHA and record from the VTA to see how the signal kind of line up in a, in a temporal sense. Um, another question that you, I get a lot at least is what is the LHA actually doing, right? What, how is it taking the signal, parsing it out and then sending that signal to the VTA? And that's another sort of future direction that we're really interested in. Okay. Uh, John was also wondering what variant of AAA V1 Cree are you using and what teeter is required to get uh, good trans, uh, transsynaptic transmission of Cree? Right. So I, I don't titer, sorry. Yeah, I, I don't, I apologize. I don't know the titer off the top of my head. It's an AV1, right? So two slash one. So that's the, the serotype that we use. 
um, if you want, you know, maybe at the coffee hour, I can I can bring up the the titer. Um, but if you're if you're interested in looking at the how AV1 Cree works, um, the paper I cite in that slide is good to look at. So it's Zing et al. 2017 Z I N G G. Okay. And then Priscilla said, great talk and just have you controlled for the retrograde movement of AAV1 Cree and does the LHA project to the SFO? The, I think the LHA has very sparse connections to the SFO. Um, I'm trying to recall. So that's another thing that I've been trying to figure out is, is to what degree is the AV1 Cree transported retrogradely? Um, to my knowledge, it's exclusively transported interrogradely, but I'm not, I can't think of the mechanisms off the, the top of my head, but it is definitely a really important control that we need to, to work out, um, either through other transsynaptic um, tracers um, or, you know, floor gold in the LHA or something like that. Okay. Uh, Michael is wondering, is, uh, said this is imperative information in trying to determine putative uh, connectivity. Would you expect general excitation of DA neurons upon SFO activation, regardless of entrained Q or water stimulus? So you're asking whether exciting SFO neurons will engage dopamine neurons, regardless of whether the animal's trained or not. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, cue or water stimulus. Right, so, right, so that's, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, one thing that's interesting about dopamine neurons, at least when you, for example, if I infuse intraorally water or the animal just licks a water zipper at libidum, you often see spikes that are, that can be time locked either to the delivery of the water into the mouth or when the animal licks, right? So in some ways, there is a signal that is being uh, communicated to the VTA to, to tell it that, hey, you know, I'm thirsty, water tastes good when I'm thirsty, here's a dopamine spike, right? Um, and I think, I, I do think the SFO is transmitting that information to the VTA. The question is, um, what is the nature of that signal, right? Is it is it communicating a broad need state, like warning signal, like I'm thirsty, I need to engage a behavior that will get me water, um, which I think it's doing the in the context of cues and environmental cues and, you know, sort of finding that watering hole, right? To what, how is that need information being translated into, okay, I need to go find water, right? And in my opinion, I think it's a complicated answer involving various brain regions, perhaps the LHA, but perhaps other brain regions that kind of converge onto the VTA. So perhaps in the untrained state, there's a very general I'm thirsty signal. But as the animal becomes trained, other brain regions are being recruited to sort of fine tune that broad signal. Just kind of speculating here. It's, those are just the ideas in my head at least. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, let's see. And so Matthew said, thanks for discussing the analytical approaches you've used. Uh, what software do you use to do the normalization and alignment of physiological responses with behavior? Are toolboxes available or did you have to code that yourself? Yeah, so our code is largely custom besides the uh, TDT bin to mat, which of course TDT provides. Um, it's and I do know some researchers who've made things like GUIs to make the process a little bit easier, but all our code is pretty much custom tailored to our experimental needs. The backbone is relatively fundamental, right? So subtracting our data, normalizing our data, um, but then what happens is, okay, how do we time lock our signal, right? So for us, we use uh, MetAssociates operand chambers the, when a cue is presented or when a water super is presented, a TTL is sent to the RZ5P, right? That goes into synapse, and then we can take our tanks and then uh, 
basically parse out when the event timestamps for when the events occurred and when the, the events occurred relative to the signal and then time lock it to that particular behavioral event. Okay, and it looks like we're maybe have time for one or two more questions. Um, let's see, so how, one of them is, do, do, do. I'm sorry, I just lost my place. Um, oh, here we go, from Preston. Can you comment on whether the calcium dynamics you measure on both VTA and the nucleus accumbens are mostly from action potentials or is some component of them due to graded potentials or intercellular metabo metabolic plasti uh, plasticity mediating the activity? Right, so that's a great question. I mean, with, with G-Camp, right, it's all we're measuring is fluxes in intracellular calcium, right? So whether the effects we see, I mean, so, so dopamine neurons, they burst basically, right? So you can measure that with electrophysiology. And as a matter of fact, the signals that we see in photometry, they line up quite well with things like EFIS or fast scan cyclic photometry. Um, the extent to which our experiments mediate things like firing rate or action potentials is something um, I'm not entirely sure of. I will say, when there have been papers demonstrating that when animals are hungry, you can get an increase in firing rate in uh, dopamine neurons. Um, so that's one glimpse into it. Um, as far as D-Lite, um, D-Lite really, so D-Lite's a modified dopamine receptor, right? It's just like G-Camp, except instead of binding calcium, it's binding dopamine, right? So it's sort of a proxy for us to measure dopamine release kind of like fast scan cyclic voltammetry. Um, and when we can go jump down a, a huge deep rabbit hole about the dynamics of dopamine release and dopamine release that's independent of cell firing and how afferents to the accumbens might modulate dopamine release. Um, and then you can layer that on by asking, okay, how does thirst change all those, those factors? Um, for us, doing photometry has been really nice in that we get this reliable, clean signal that's uh, repeatable, right? So for us, as, if it looks, if, it, if it's looking like, and we're able to quantify it, um, then it's working for us. And, you know, where our laboratory has a history of doing uh, fast scan cyclic voltammetry to measure dopamine release, right? So in a way for us, that's kind of a positive control to what we see in when we use photometry. Okay. And then the next question is from Marie, and it's could uh, angiotensin II act directly on dopamine neurons? Uh, are there any receptors expressed there? Right. So the easy, the short answer is there's not many receptors there. Um, so we expect that angi angiotensin II does not act directly on the VTA. That said, it's not to say the VTA doesn't receive need state signals directly, right? So particularly in the context of feeding behavior and hunger, there are uh, many experiments demonstrating that uh, hormones that originate from the periphery um, can act directly onto the, onto the VTA. Um, I will say that um, we like the synaptic mechanism mainly because in dopamine neurons, the spike happens extraordinarily fast, right? So for a hormone to travel from the periphery and then cross the blood-brain barrier and then act in the VTA is a little bit um, slower, right? Um, so we, we've opted towards this, the synaptic route. All right. Well, I think, let's see. Oh, here's a more technical question. Um, how did you deal with the problem of twisting of uh, fiber optics ah, when your rats rotate? That's a great uh, question. <laughs> use a commutator. Exactly. So um, we we actually, I in, our, in the early days of our photometry experience, we didn't have a commutator. So we just had the uh, long patch cords going into our breadboard. And that was tremendous. I think there was one day where I broke like four patch cords in a day or something like that. Um, so since then we've, we've switched to the, the commutator that you can get from Dork. Um, and it's been amazing. We've, we, we love the commutator. Um, I've heard things like signal loss associated with using the commutator. Um, for us, that hasn't been a huge problem. It's been working great. 
Okay, very good. I apologize, there are more questions, but we have just hit three o'clock. So on that, I'm going to end with uh, Sinead, Conway, or Sinead Conway said, great talk, beautiful data. And um, I believe that is all for here. So if you didn't get to have your question uh, presented and answered, um, I'll, I'll send this on to Ted and then feel free to log on for our coffee hour next week. Just look for an email. We'll have the date and the time and, you know, we'll set up a Zoom meeting to go do that. So with that, thank you so much, Ted, for taking the time out of your day to present your research. It was thank you, quite um, excellent to watch. Thank you. Appreciate and um, yeah, thank you guys so much for, for tuning in for the entire thing. All right. Have a good rest of your day and look forward to seeing you soon. Take care, everybody. Bye.